What's going on, everybody? This is James Grandmaster Facts Boys, and you're here for another episode of the Facts Project. Today, very special guest, repeat guest, Wells Thompson. We are here to talk about Catskin and the Rose. Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. Look, look, I appreciate everything you do because this is like our third chat. Uh, Dalton is, al- is always with us. He's here for with sure. us. He's here with us in spirit. Uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, D- Dalton needed a break, and so I figured this is the best time to to break out my solo project. This is the the solo album, if you will. Got it. okay. Look, Not- it's, ever so often, you know, George Michael did it. Justin Absolutely. Timberlake did it. You know, like Michael, <laughs> Michael Jackson did it with his brother. It's okay. It happens. <laughs> but um, more so, I I've I've of course have had and had the ability to talk about your work for for a number of projects mm-hmm. now and um you've you've tackled a an action horror ip in frankenstein the unconquered you've had a, a you have a family friendly uh sci-fi uh comic called mechaton that you have mm-hmm. at your stable you've done depths which is more of a passion project of course uh historical going back in time and then talking about an intricate story about an underwater adventure yeah, and much now, more literary yeah. yeah and now now we're here in an adventure romance graphic novella uh in the in the terms of how i think how you called it you said princess bride meets uh what was it revolutionary <laughs> revolutionary Nova, girl Nova Nova Terra? Which is, yeah which is a classic uh like 80s 90s anime that is just like the most sapphic thing you've ever seen very uh revolutionary in terms of like uh sort of introducing that kind of media to to united states audiences right um and and sort of has that um you know that that overall like sapphic adventure kind of vibe to it so right and no do a random disclaimer you will be hearing the word sapphic <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> but um the characters that of course that take place in this story you you uh you you pretty much detail a a young girl named Zelda and mm-hmm. uh, of course the the counter protagonist in this in this issue a foreigner by the name of Camille 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 yeah yeah Zelda and, uh, and Camille now what they are looking for of course is sort of the same thing but not necessarily mm-hmm. um different but, angles on on sort of the same thing they live right. both of them live kind of in a stratified society they want this is a chance for them to break out of poverty that they really don't get in you know uh in, in their day-to-day lives uh and this was you know this is the, in their view the best way of getting out of it the the setup is that there's this tournament going on. It it only uh, comes around uh, once every couple of decades when when someone from the royal family is is of age to marry, and then uh, people from the opposite sex have this uh, sword fighting contest to decide who's going to be the one to marry them. Um, and so, uh, like, it's about a union of, or like, the result is a union of people, but the reasons for doing it are are very mercenary. Uh, and then as they they are the finalists in this competition, as they fight each other to decide who's, you know, going to uh, take the prize, they realize they have a stronger connection with each other than they do with, uh, you know, this prince that is kind of a, a cruel asshole. Uh, ah. So it, it you know, it, it just kind of plays off of that and sort of builds the relationship from there. Yeah. And the, the tournament you're talking about is the Grand Tournament of Ascension. Yeah. And uh, they are. They are fighting for the hand of Prince Damien, mm-hmm. who is of half Catskin origin himself because his mother, right. Queen Baydoon, uh, the Queen of Baydoon, is uh, Baydoon. is also a Catskin as well. And yes, who she, basically she fought... was the last winner of the, the competition, and she came like a Zelda from that lower caste, from that poor mm. uh, background. So I'm going to say that a Zelda has looked at... at the queen almost as an example of a means For to sure. to get out. Yeah, there's definitely like that recognition of, of if you can do it, I can do it there. Right. And now the, basically what do, what do you think in this story is perceived by Prince Damien? Like uh, we see him as arrogant. We see him as yeah. someone who's oh, I mean, I, I, cruel. <laughs> I think he sees, you know, this as a a festivity and and sort of he wants uh 
he like you know anyone that would that would be born into that position has been told his entire life that he's you know special and above everyone else and he's taken it to heart so he sees people fighting over him and he thinks it's correct and and right and Mm -hmm. that he's he's a prize to be won um and that he like and tends to see the people around him as as less autonomous beings and more kind of objects for him to control that's what Um, i got Absolutely. So he, I don't, I don't think he's like a particularly like clever manipulator or anything. He just has a lot of power and mm-hmm. is kind of a spoiled kid in that regard. Yeah. And in this tournament, it's not like people are basically beaten and beaten into submission. People have to die. Yeah. No, it's a fight to the death. Mm. And, and sort of the go- like, that's sort of the, you know, gory backdrop of this is uh, if you want to, to climb the ranks, you have to slit some throats. Mm. Uh so yeah, and that that's that's what they know that that's the those are the stakes. That's that's what they signed up for. Right now, necessarily, you have uh, Camille, who is more of an outcast foreigner mm-hmm. who has traveled far and wide to basically um, come to this uh, yeah. tournament and kind of like prove her favor. And nobody knows who she is. Right. It's she sort of has you know. Uh, a bit of a you know a, a small reputation just from you know you, you don't walk into town <laughs> this, this is not this kind of society where like you you walk into town looking uh completely different from everyone else and people aren't going to talk mm-hmm. uh so she sort of has a reputation going in people know why she's there and like it wasn't an easy test this isn't you know uh this is sort of set in a more you know uh medieval byzantine kind of period so it's not okay like, it's not like it's easy to get from point a to point b travel takes a long time gotcha. so it was it so obviously her her being there is a trial in and of itself mm-hmm. uh and the fact that she sticks out like a sore, sore thumb just kind of makes everyone uh you know all the more aware of her so they're aware of her background and they're they're you know aware of her what she's trying to do she's clearly made a name of her for herself in this tournament mm-hmm. uh being one of the finalists she has presumably cut down quite a few people to be here right uh so people have gotten to see her and get and get to know her and she is sort of the favorite of the tournament by the end uh mm. the crowd is a little bit more on her side it feels like prince damien is a little bit more on her side um but yeah she's she's there more or less for the same reason as Zelda is uh she grew up poor and she wants to uh to to have that sense of security mm. and and it's it's sad that Zelda doesn't necessarily get any hometown love because this is basically where she is and she doesn't yeah. have to be in a favorite <laughs> well I mean yeah being being that kind of like lower caste they they don't see her as like oh this is our girl it's like she's it's like... basically not a person mm. uh, is the way they treat her damn Mm. now um necessarily um i'm gonna say that the end setting is of course the final battle between uh, zelda and camille but sure the precursors beforehand between their individual battles beforehand how do they find a common ground where is the time in which they uh, it, it necessarily starts... see each other yeah well, no, they they don't. It starts on that battlefield. It starts and like during the last or in the Colosseum during the final battle, and that's the time that they have to meet, gain each other's respect, and sort of, uh, you know, uh, g- gain that understanding. I felt like part of the challenge of doing this was how do you convince a reader that two people could fall in love in like the short of this yeah like it like almost like like in in the span of this like short amount of time and the and these really intense circumstances uh and i feel like i felt like you know doing the entire tournament arc first of all would have taken too long i I would have had to have you know 40 50 more pages of build up uh in order to do that which is which would have been cool, but it wasn't what I wanted to do with this. Uh, I was mm-hmm. I was trying to make it a little bit shorter. I was trying to make it more of a one shot, uh, and the fact that it turned into a, this sixty eight page uh, graphic novella uh, was longer even than I initially intended. I thought it was going to be like thirty two to forty eight pages. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, had I done that, had I done something like um, 
you know, uh, if you've read Do a Power Bomb, they sort of have that dynamic of of you know having the matches and and sort of setting up the tournament arc uh, of of the whole comic. Mm-hmm. Like that would have been a lot of fun for sure. And there's definitely uh, there definitely would have been space for that, but it, it wasn't the particular challenge I wanted to to right. uh, tackle with this book. Yeah, they almost revolve around like that. The end setting is the beginning, and they revolve the story around that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Now, now, no, there is reality shows called Love at First Sight that does that does the <laughs> whole ninety second thing. So this is like this is okay to do stuff like this. Sure, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, it was. I, I, we were talking beforehand. You, you were curious how, like, you know, why I I wanted to flip and do a romance because I've done all these other genres before. Yeah, and, and part of it was just like I've never. Uh, it's never been a uh, genre that's really interested me. Um, okay. But having, you know, started to read a little bit more romance comics, uh, books with like I, more to the forefront sort of uh, romantic plots, mm-hmm. uh, I got a little bit more, you know, excited about the idea of like, oh, how how would I, you know, could I convincingly write this? Um, which is where a lot of my... Uh, you know best ideas come from is just like what would i do with this genre that i haven't really touched before um yeah yeah, not to give too too much of the of the future away but i recently wrote a script that basically started with like you know (laughs) uh you know smut's pretty popular on on kickstarter i wonder i wonder how i would i would tackle that and then suddenly i started writing and i was like oh this is fun this is interesting i like these characters right right um And it, and it was sort of the same story with with Catskin, just in a more like you know romance adventure type feel. Uh, again, that like that that princess bride vibe, which is not a a movie I grew up with, but one that I watched for the first time in college, and uh, it sort of stuck with me from there. Well, I can tell you, I did. <laughs> yeah, no, and yeah. and tons of people was, did, and like yeah. people love that movie. For, for Absolutely, good the references and everything is great. Oh, it's it's so good. Uh, the the dialogue is super sharp. The it's like it's purposefully schmaltzy in a way that uh that sort of lets you kind of d- d- absorb yourself into yes. it, and to the point where you don't really notice it after a certain point. Yeah, it's yeah, like no, how, it's, it's the only movie you could typecast Andre the Giant in. Yeah. And, oh, this makes sense. <laughs> yeah no it's it's so good um and that was you know that was half the half the appeal of of doing the book was sort of paying a little bit of homage to that uh and getting to play around with those tropes and uh story structure so yeah, yeah I'm, I'm 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 excited to i'm excited that i got to write it it was it was one of the most fun one of the most natural scripts i've ever written um <laughs> but but i think before the the script i had done before that I had to bang out in over the course of like four or five months is like 110, 120 page script that I just was pulling teeth the entire time. And it wasn't until the like middle of the second full revision that I realized Mm -hmm. that's what the story is. Okay. Now we can actually start building, you know, this out and and making it make sense. Mm. Um, Whereas this, I mean, from in from the inception to the first full draft done, it took about five or six days of just mm. me excitedly at a you know pumping out pages, doing you know thirteen, okay. fourteen pages at a time, uh, just because I, I was really in love with the idea and in love with the characters and wanted now, to, bring it to life. <laughs> now, also in that same same breath, we talk about the references and yeah. where where this. This whole thing came from but mm-hmm. then there's also the distinctive element that you're writing two queer characters and then mm-hmm. it's like where do you get this reference from well the the initial inspiration was uh a uh, uh anthology that was on kickstarter last year and and a little bit before that pulling like um you know uh submissions and it was uh, Sharp Wit in the Company of Women by uh, Brent Fisher and, and Michelle Abounder, um, which is is shipping now. I, I hope to have it to, to my house soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that that was very much about like women with swords. That was the whole vibe of the thing. And I was like, okay, okay what would I do with that? And that was why I wanted to, to sort of do uh, 
do this story in the first place. It was supposed to be a four page script and it just blew up. Um, why two queer women? Uh, I, I mean, logistically, it made a lot of sense if there's a prince that needs to be, you know, that, that needs to marry someone, and especially if it's, like, a royal thing where presumably the point of the marriage is to produce more princes, princesses. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense to, it makes sense that they're both of the, op- of, of the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, I, it's romance, so, it's, so you're going to go there. Uh, mm-hmm. But also, like, having read Sunstone, having read... Uh, commander rao and all of these incredible indie comics about queer romances uh the subject matter didn't feel like unfamiliar to me i was aware Mm -hmm. of like the the type of archetype and also in my life just like almost all of my good friends are are happen to be uh queer women so i kind of live around that uh culture more or less every day it wasn't like I was approaching this out of whole cloth. It, was, it felt very natural to be like, "Yeah, this is who these people are," and it makes sense that they would they would be right. attracted. Well, well, let, to be honest, to even go there, the entire team that put this together, aside from you, oh, absolutely, yeah, and that was that was intentional. I wanted the I wanted the team to reflect the the subject matter. Yeah. So yeah, our our editor Krista Herreder, uh, our uh, artist rachel disler letterer mm-hmm. uh uh keila sabal uh all uh openly sapphic women rachel right. is, is married to a woman so um and and part of the like it was it was twofold i wanted to specifically do that because i wanted that voice represented and i also wanted to like you know cover my shortcomings so that if i presented something that wasn't honest or, or was in any way like you know right not uh representing the community uh well they would be able to say hey i think this would work better yeah now did you feel as though like when you were pitching the comic to them like like did their did their eyes bug out and they tried to give you ideas or they were like totally accepting of it be like do you we'll handle our part yeah it was it was i mean it was it was not necessarily like like they wanted to they were really excited about the story uh just the way i pitched it to them uh but yeah the first i mean the first draft I, I gave directly to Rachel and she uh, added a lot of story notes. She added a lot of influence and, and a couple of scenes got added uh, as a result. Most of it was from an art, from like an artist perspective, just like, Hey, if we move this scene somewhere, we can do more dynamic fight choreography and stuff like that, right. which is really what you want uh, out of that conversation for sure. Um, there were a couple of like, you know, what if we had this small moment to bring them to kind of develop the relationship? And I've said that makes a lot of sense, and then and then took that and sort of made it its own thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in my own words. Uh, but yeah, it always felt like a very smooth and and sort of gelled a uh, uh, creative process. Uh, there was there wasn't a lot of friction. It was just, hey, I have a cool idea. Cool, let's make it happen. Right, right, right. Now, uh, necessarily the overlying theme outside of all of this is monarchy. And generally when people um, start to put a, put together a story through monarchy, they, they do like to detail the unforeseen, unconventional ways that mm-hmm. they go about constructing their families. And this tournament, in the sense of the word, is just like, if you look at it from the outside, looking mm. at us living in a civilized world, it's like this is diabolical. Like people have to kill yeah. <laughs> in order to 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 win the hand of somebody. Yeah. Who they pretty much are thinking to themselves, this yeah. dude, I got to marry this asshole. I got to kill all <laughs> these people to be with this guy. You know? Yeah. And I have yeah, to no, but that the... blood on my hands the entire time. For sure. Uh, and the real life history of, of monarchy is, is just as weird and, yes. and, and stratified. And, uh, you know, I think it's in my own personal headcanon, like I'm not going, this isn't something I want to like explode into a, you know, uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones style, you know, epic or anything. Mm-hmm. But in my own personal headcanon, the, you know, as all royal families do, they were running into problems where they were running out of people to grab that were not inside the family already. Yeah. And instead of just being like, let's just start marrying cousins, they uh, came up with this kind of insane thing that would 
be part, you know, part getting new blood into the into the royal family, part blood sport to appease the masses. And on top of all that, you get to kind of create this illusion of uh, of of class uh, uh, mobility where, hey, someone has a chance to, to be rich and to be powerful right. uh, that could come from even the lowest caste. And, and that happens once every, you know, two decades or, or however long. Uh, but it's still something you it's still a story you get to tell uh, yeah. and becomes part of the culture and, and keeps people from, you know, making guillotines. <laughs> it's true. Now, now in, the, uh, <laughs> in the character of uh, the, the, the Queen of Bidun, who's a who, who's a cat skin herself. She's yeah. soft spoken in a sense, but does she live with an ounce of regret of what? basically transpire when she became became queen oh there well funny you should mention we have as a um potential uh stretch goal we're doing a three-page comic i saw that tango yeah that sort of shows her story of what happened when how she won uh her position and she is one of my favorite characters for sure in the story uh she doesn't get a lot of page time like we don't spend a lot of time with her at least not now in this in this first book uh but she to me represents a lot of like you know the complicity of the people who who are able to benefit from uh such an obviously like stratified system yeah uh you know, there, there's so many examples of history in history of people who get the chance to climb the ladder and then immediately burn, like, kick it down behind them or, or mm. pull it up behind them uh, to keep anyone else from following because they're so unused to having power and they're so scared that it's going to be taken away from them that they're just unwilling to let go for any reason. Right. Um, so part of that I wanted to reflect in. I think there's... I definitely think that she, you know, she has lost quite a bit of herself in this position, mm -hmm. which is shown physically. She, her, her sword arm has been removed uh, and replaced with this golden prosthetic. Uh, metaphorically, she isn't given a name other than the queen because she kind of gave that up when she became the queen. She doesn't really have right. an identity anymore. Uh, and, and just on her face, I think she wears a certain level of like, you know, internally always asking the question of like was this worth it yeah um which is something that our our characters have to confront as well like, yeah because like, uh, would, would this be worth it instantaneously of course within i'm lord knows how many pages but mm -hmm. in 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 dynamics of how this tournament how long their match may last mm -hmm. uh there's elements of uh of course not only infatuation Mm -hmm. curiosity with each other but necessarily the decisions that they have to make in the moment because right. if one does happen to banish or kill the other you know mm -hmm. they get to move up the ranks and i'm sure there's a life of riches and treasures beyond any bound right. of imagination in which they have no idea where they're going to go <laughs> but all in the same breath they they also come to realize be like you know if we like take this very seriously and just say stop the match we're both going to die Romeo and Juliet yeah. style without it's, the poison <laughs> yeah it's one of those things where you know they uh, n no kingdom has ever uh, taken lightly to being uh, you know uh, told no. Yeah. Or, or in any way defied so yeah they they have and and particularly with prince damien's rep rep uh, reputation and the more we see of him the more we come to understand like he's this isn't he's gonna take it personally he, it, there's no way it's just gonna be like okay you guys made your decision that's fine we'll mm -hmm. we'll find someone else right. like that that's never gonna be a possibility so uh so yeah there's a lot at stake for sure um one or both of their lives are definitely at stake in in all of this proceeding no matter how it shakes out so uh that definitely factors into how they how they make decisions and and what uh they wind up doing to uh resolve everything mm. and now and now also knowing that this isn't a one shot and there is a continuation and the, yeah, possi <laughs> the possibility of moving beyond this is like 
I'll would, say there's there's a possibility. I'm not committing to anything firm right now. Okay. A, par, a big part of what I wanted to do with this was tell a complete story, and I feel very strongly that we've done that. Gotcha. Um, however, me being me, as soon as I say I want to make you know a one shot and be done with it, and and you know if we never make another one, that's fine. Of course, uh, when I, you know, when I finished writing the first draft, I'm like, well, this is begging for a sequel. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not against the idea either. If there's a good, if there's a juicy enough story there, and there is uh, enough there that that me and Rachel want to explore in a sequel, then yeah, we will pursue that absolutely. Definitely. Now, as far as the reception that you've seen so far on Kickstarter and putting mm -hmm. this together, and this being somewhat your first romance story that you've created. How would you feel the reception's going so far from the from the comments of what you've been seeing? I, I think people have been hungry for something like this for a while. Yeah. Uh and and I've I've gotten nothing but uh really enthusiastic responses. People are uh yeah, pe people are really excited about it. Um this is probably our strongest launch uh we've ever had. Uh we're coming up on you know, our, I, I think our, our largest successful Kickstarter was uh, around 12,000, you know, 250 something or $12,500. And we're quickly coming up on, uh, on that mark on this one. Mm. We're not even halfway through. So I uh, monetarily, it speaks volumes backer wise. We, we have over, you know, we have almost 250 right now. There's clearly a large audience for this. And, right. Uh, yeah, we're, we're super excited to be uh, providing that. Yeah, because you can, you can honestly see that, like, amongst projects that are out there indie-wise, there's not yeah. a lot of them that really, like, dive into romance. For sure. Uh, for most definitely. And and it's it's I guess it's a niche and maybe and maybe even some of the things that you said earlier, because uh the, the NSFW community and Kickstarter, you if you do a modern scroll up, you do see a little bit. Yeah. Oh, no, you, you, you definitely get a lot of that on Kickstarter for sure. Right. And <laughs> not that. It, and, and by the way, there's a lot of really great, you know, yes. erotic and smut on Kickstarter like that deserves all that attention and i'm really happy uh uh yet or two days ago um natasha uh i don't know how to say her last name altair okay. uh uh, re uh launched uh sapphic pulp and it has almost 500 uh backers and is just like tearing through its its goal yeah. uh and it looks fantastic i'm a backer i i, I want to read it um <laughs> And I, I encourage everyone to, to, to check it out. Uh, so, yeah, there's definitely that niche. And that is uh, you know, well explored. Um, but, yeah, I, I the romance aspect, there definitely are uh, comics that come along. But for the most part, it is a lot of action. It is a lot of superheroes. It is a lot of horror. And I think there is a, a, a hungry audience out there looking yeah. for stuff like this I, I felt like there was pretty much a void and you filled it at least for the time being with a comic that probably wasn't well, definitely it, yeah it was the only so one I'll, that was there i'll say shout out to uh slice of life from cat calamia they are uh finishing up uh their campaign as well for for their long running uh uh romance uh or queer romance uh, comic, uh, which is a web comic as well uh so we're certainly not the only ones out there but yeah. Uh, but absolutely, yeah, no, no, it's 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 something that's I think again people are hungry for and and um, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna like stay here forever. This isn't gonna be the only. This isn't gonna be my solo. I don't I don't think there's any genre that I'm gonna stick in forever. Uh, yeah, I, I can see something, that. Some amounts of creative ADHD, where I always feel like I need to do something different and weird. But um, but yeah, uh, this has been super fun to write, and I I will probably come back to it at some point. Yeah, because if if we're talking about it, it's July. Yeah, I've, been, I've 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 had the ability to talk to you about three of your projects, but I know you put out four. Mm -hmm. What what is next? Um. Oh, what's next? Uh, we're doing uh Frankenstein the Unconquered's coming back. Okay. With Vengeance. Uh, number three and number four. We're doing uh next um or. Yeah, probably toward the end of August, we're going to put that out. We're going to turn right around and do that. Um, 
and we want to relaunch depths before the end of the year, whether that's on uh, uh, this platform or another. Uh, we want to uh, get that out and uh, and hopefully fully funded and made. Uh, we've got some plans with Mechaton for sure. We have to get the uh, trade out first through Scout. They are uh, they're putting the uh, full collected trade together. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and beyond that, uh, I have one or two projects in the bag that I would love to to bust out, but I'm not in a hurry to necessarily make anything on. And uh, I know Dalton has been uh, working on his own solo project, uh, something uh, <laughs> uh, something he's actually been working on since he was like. Uh, you know, eight before I met him, eighteen or nineteen, he started writing these characters, Bryce and Wesley, which are very like uh, Calvin and Hobbes, but it's a kid and his robot. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm really excited to see what he potentially does with that. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot in the works, <laughs> and I, I, I you know I wish I had all the answers for like what's going to unfold, what people are going to gravitate toward. Uh, I'm sure we'll come up with a, some kind of crazy idea and, and want to push it out the door at some point. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to getting more uh, Frankenstein the Unconquered made. That's going to be probably my main focus going into 2024 is is doing more of those stories. Excellent. Well, Wells, man, look, it, it feels like now anything that you've been able to put out there to the world, uh, you definitely have a home for it here. So keep pushing, my friend. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks Absolutely. For having me back. Absolutely. So uh, once again, James Graham, Mass Effects voice, Wells Thompson, thank you for being here once again. This is this this has been fantastic. Catskin and the Rose is now fully funded on Kickstarter, but there's always a, a little wiggle room to to get the comic if you haven't gotten it already. 20 more oh, days. For sure. Definitely. That's it for 20, sure. Yeah, 20 more days. We got plenty of time and we got stretch goals galore to, to aim for. We got uh, new stickers, new enamel pins coming out, uh, new prints from Angela Wu if we get to $20,000. Uh, we've got uh, Fell Hounds, uh, Do You Believe in an Afterlife is a free uh, comic we're giving away to all backers at $12,000. Uh, we're going to do an insert to the first comic that me and uh, Rachel did together. Uh, it's just a front and back two pager, but it's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, and at twenty thousand uh, and twenty seven fifty, we're gonna do a three page story and a five page story as an extra, and that'll go out to all digital backers as well as be put into the special edition of the book. Excellent, man. Yeah, hey, looking forward to it. Once again, you have a lot of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. For, For sure. sure. No, I want to push those numbers. I want to get. I want to see how far we can go. All right. Well, I, uh, I'm glad we've done our <laughs> man. So. Uh, for both of us here at the Facts Project, thank you for joining us. Wells, good to see you, brother. And we are out. Mm -hmm.